Hi everyone, Mervyn Dorr here from Faith Community Church. Last week, we took a look at the grace of God and what the scripture means where it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. We discovered that as a result of one man's sin, that man being Adam, sin and death abounded or spread throughout all of mankind. But God, beloved, knowing all things, had a plan from the very beginning to send his son, Jesus Christ, on a rescue mission to deliver us, to save mankind from their sins. In the garden on that fateful day when Adam and Eve sinned, God declared his plan in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, speaking to the serpent who deceived them. God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now the word enmity here means hostility. I like how the New American Standard Bible translates this verse. It says, I will make enemies of you and the woman and of your offspring and her descendant, capital D. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. We can see very clearly that this verse, church, points to Jesus, the Son of God. He would come to earth as the second Adam, on a rescue mission to do what the first Adam had failed to do. Now, to better understand this, we need to know, what did God command the first Adam to do? Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 tells us, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. In other words, church, God put man in charge to govern the earth. Adam was given authority over the earth and over every living creature. It was his job to subdue. In other words, take authority over that serpent in the garden. But the first Adam failed. And as a result of his failure, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, sin abounded. It spread like a cancer throughout all of mankind. And as a result of that sin, beloved, came death. But John chapter 3, verse 16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You see, church, where sin abounded, God's grace abounded much more. Amen? Now we're going to look at how we can attract or find grace in the eyes of the Lord. And to do that, we're going to look at the life of Noah. Fast forward to Genesis chapter 6. Here we read about the story of Noah, and we touched on that story last week. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 7 tells us that after the fall of Adam, the Lord saw, the Lord saw, sorry, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. So we read here how greatly God is disturbed with the world and its wickedness. God, church, was so grieved that he declares here in verse 7 that he's about to blot out mankind. 
And the word here in Hebrew for blot out means to exterminate. Church, it's so important that we truly understand the gravity of the situation here for God to take the action that he said he is about to take. He tells us that every intention, listen, every intention of mankind was only evil continually. This is telling us, church, that mankind was on a collision course of destroying themselves. But remember, God made a promise. He made a promise to the man and the woman back in the garden in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that her descendant, someone directly linked to her bloodline, would come and crush the head of the serpent. So although in Genesis chapter 6, verse 7, God pronounced judgment upon the whole world, we now read in verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, church, Noah found favor in God's sight. And a result of that favor, Noah and his family would be spared from the flood. And that would, beloved, preserve a bloodline. You got to get this. The salvation of Noah and his family preserved a bloodline directly coming down from Eve through which God could fulfill his promise that he made in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. But why Noah? Why Noah? What set him apart from the rest of mankind? Why did God find grace Oh, I'm sorry, why did Noah find grace in the eyes of the Lord? What did God see in him? What lessons can we learn from his example? And how can this knowledge, beloved, help us find grace in the eyes of the Lord today? Now, the Bible gives us clear understanding as to what caused Noah to find grace in the eyes of the Lord, both in the Old and New Testaments. So first, let's take a look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. It says here, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. So we discover here three things that attracted God's grace toward Noah. Number one, Noah was righteous. Number two, Noah was blameless. And number three, it says here, Noah walked with God. So he was righteous, he was blameless, and Noah walked with God. The Hebrew word used here for righteous in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, means that he was ethical. He was principled. Church, he was honest and he was just. Noah did what was morally right. Now, church, you got to understand something. This took place way before the law of Moses was ever written. So, how could Noah? know what was morally right. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans that God's moral code has been written in the consciences of men and women way before the law of Moses was ever written on tablets of stone. Now, church, Noah was righteous because he followed his conscience. He knew through his conscience what was morally right from what was morally wrong, and he lived accordingly. Genesis chapter 6 verse 9 goes on to tell us, number two, that Noah was blameless. So number one, we found out that Noah was righteous, and he was righteous because he lived according to the moral code of God 
that was inscribed on his heart, written in his conscience, that made him righteous before the Lord. He was pursuing the ways of the Lord. And here in verse 9, we're going to find out that Noah was blameless. The word for blameless here is also translated as perfect. But understand, beloved, it didn't mean that Noah was sinless. The word used for blameless here in chapter 6, verse 9, means that Noah walked with integrity. He was a man of moral integrity among the people of his generation. And this set Noah apart from the rest of mankind, whom, as we read, the Bible describes as having evil intentions in their hearts continually. Beloved, Noah lived in a time when men and women sought to do evil continually. So when men and women sought to do evil, get this picture, Noah sought to do good. He sought to do the opposite. Number three, Genesis 6 Verse 9 tells us that Noah walked with God. So number one, Noah was righteous. Number two, he was blameless. And number three, Noah walked with God. In other words, this is how his righteousness and his integrity was demonstrated. You see, church, Noah lived in an evil generation. And among those that were evil... Noah had to make a choice. He had to make the choice, beloved, not to follow the crowd. He had to make the choice, beloved, not to compromise his convictions. He was going to obey the promptings of his conscience, even if it meant that he would be unpopular. He chose, beloved, to carry on the legacy of his great-grandfather, who was Enoch. Genesis chapter 5, verse 23 and 24 tells us that Enoch lived 365 years, walking in close fellowship with God. It goes on to say that one day he disappeared because God took him. You know, beloved, Enoch never tasted death. And it's believed by many that he'll be one of the two end time witnesses in the book of Revelation chapter 11 that God will send to the earth during the great tribulation. So Noah walked with God in close fellowship like his great grandfather Enoch did. So what did this walking with God in Noah's case, look like. Genesis chapter 4 records the birth of Seth, the son of Adam that had replaced his son Cain. Genesis chapter 4 verse 26 tells us that it was during this time that people first began to worship the Lord by name. Noah, as a righteous man in his day, would have walked with God as a worshiper. He would have spent time worshiping and calling upon the name of the Lord. We also know from Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, that offering sacrifices to God was established with Cain and Abel. So Noah church as a blameless man, a man of integrity, would have honored God by offering sacrifices to the Lord that were pleasing in his sight. Church, saying that Noah walked with God means that Noah walked with God according to God's ways. He didn't have his own agenda. He didn't make his own plans and then present them to God and ask God to kiss them and bless them. No, he walked in step with the ways of the Lord, seeking him, calling him, worshiping him, and offering sacrifices to him. 
twice in Genesis chapter 6, verse 22, and also in chapter 7, verse 5, the Bible records that Noah did according to all that God commanded him. So Noah's walk with God was that of a worshiper who lived sacrificially in obedience to the ways of God. In the New Testament, we learn in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, that the obedience of Noah came from faith. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Church Noah, by faith, was obedient, and by that faith, he became an heir of righteousness. Here, we see a pattern of faith, obedience, and righteousness that comes by faith for us today. A faith, beloved, that causes us to find grace in the eyes of the Lord. By faith, we today, being warned of God, by the signs all around us of his judgment soon to come, are being called, beloved, to prepare our hearts and that of our households out of a holy reverence for him, so that we can live ready as heirs of this righteousness that Christ won for us on the cross. Amen? Now, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 tells us that Noah was also a preacher of righteousness. See, beloved, you got to get this picture. Noah didn't only live a righteous life for himself. He also, beloved, proclaimed the righteousness of God to others even though he lived among a wicked and perverse generation. Here we see another pattern from the life of Noah for us today in finding the grace of the Lord, of finding grace in the eyes of the Lord. Church, not only are we called to live according to God's righteousness, but you and I, we are called we are commissioned to proclaim this righteousness to others. Church, do you know why it's so important that you and I find grace in the eyes of the Lord today? I mean, think about it. Didn't God promise in Genesis chapter 9, verses 9 through 11, to never destroy the earth again by a flood? Oh, he did. He even promised to set the rainbow in the sky after the rain to remind us of this promise in verses 12 through 17. So then why do you and I need to find grace in the eyes of the Lord today? Church, here's the truth. We're not facing the threat of another worldwide flood. But we are facing God's dire warning of the end of the world as we know it. So just like Noah, we need today to find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Peter warns us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 13, that just as the world was once destroyed by water, so it shall be destroyed by fire when Jesus returns. And just like in Noah's day, Peter warns us that there will be scoffers who mock God's warning and the truth of his word as the day of the Lord approaches. He tells us in verse 4, they will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? 
from before the times of our ancestors, everything is still the same since the world was first created. Church, listen. Instead of holding fast to God's word, Peter prophesied of a time when people will forsake the truth of God's word and follow their own desires. Let me ask you, are we there yet? I think so. He says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, they deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. He then goes on to remind us in verse 8, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. Church, what Peter is saying here is that we must remember that our God is not bound by time as we know it. So don't be deceived into thinking just because a lot of time has passed since these words were prophesied that God's not going to do what he promised. Peter goes on to explain in verses 9 and 10. Listen, the Lord isn't being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. In light of all of this, Peter then tells us in verses 11 through 14, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. He says in verse 12, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth. He has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. Beloved, there's coming a day where there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And the rule of that day will be God's righteousness. So you and I, we have to learn now to buddy up with the righteousness of God if we're ever going to experience this glorious day that he promises us. He says in verse 14, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort. Make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. So while we wait for the promise of God to be filled, fulfilled, beloved, Peter calls us to be diligent, to make every effort to be found by him, living in peace, without spot, pure and blameless in his sight. Church, listen. Just like Noah in his day found grace in the eyes of the Lord, so do we now need to be found in him living in peace, 
pure, and blameless in God's sight. Church, listen. The only way that you and I can find this grace in the eyes of the Lord today is when you and I are hidden in Christ. In order to find grace in the eyes of the Lord, beloved, we must be righteous in his sight. Church, thank God the message of the cross tells us that God sent his only son in order to do just that, in order to make us righteous in his sight. Because here's the truth, beloved, without Jesus, Isaiah 64 verse 6 tells us that our righteousness is like filthy rags. But thank God, beloved, Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9 tells us God showed his great love for us by sending Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Beloved, listen, this blessing of God's righteousness is made available to everyone who demonstrates true faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Romans chapter 3 verses 24 through 26 tells us, God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair. Listen. When he held back, I'll say it again, this sacrifice shows that God was being fair. When he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past, for he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Church, do you see this? God, in his justice, spared Noah because he endeavored to walk with God during his lifetime. This was before the cross. God knew that his son was going to die for Noah's sin, imputing to him his righteousness. This is what made Noah an heir of the righteousness because he died, beloved, in faith, believing God. Because Noah demonstrated faith in God and purpose to walk in his ways, God included him in what his son would one day do. So Noah obtained by faith, not a righteousness in himself, but a righteousness that was coming in the future through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Church, listen, we now obtain by faith a righteousness that already came in the past through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So Noah looked ahead at what God had promised. We now look back at that same promise having already been fulfilled in Christ. Camp out on that one, because this is good stuff. Amen? So like Noah Church, we too must be blameless 
in our generation. To be blameless means to be complete, mature, to be everything God desires us to be. Once again, beloved, we must cling to the gospel to provide for us everything we need to be blameless. So how does the gospel make us blameless? First, the gospel gives us the blood of Christ, which cleanses us from our sin. First John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So number one, the Bible gives us the blood of Christ to cleanse us from our sins. Number two, the Bible gives us, or the gospel rather, gives us the word of God to train us and lead us to maturity. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Number three, the gospel gives us, beloved, the inner strength of the spirit to help us in our weaknesses, causing us to become blameless in his sight. The apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. And fourth, beloved, through the gospel, God equips us and leads us to victory. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse three says, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. Amen. Church, listen, if we're going to find grace in the eyes of the Lord, like Noah, we must be righteous and we must be blameless and we too must walk with God. Paul warns in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 17 through 20, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Church Ephesians 5 goes on in verse 1 to tell us that we are to become followers of God as dear children. So how do we do that? Well, it goes on in verse uh, in, in chapter five to tell us that we do this, become followers of God when we walk in love, when we walk as children of the light and expose the sins of darkness, when we walk as those who are wise with an understanding of what the will of the Lord is. Finally, church like Noah, listen, we find grace in the eyes of the Lord when we do all that God has commanded us to do. The Bible teaches us that Noah did all that God commanded him. He didn't just do a few things, beloved, that God said to do. Hear me. He did everything that God called him to do. Everything that God Called him to do. Genesis chapter 6, verse 22 tells us Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. Church, I want you to know 
The Lord hasn't lowered his standards since then. Jesus commissioned his church in Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20, to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Teaching them to observe all that Christ has commanded us. James tells us in doing so, beloved, we demonstrate that our faith is a living faith, a faith that is evidenced by good works. In doing so, like Noah, beloved, we then will be preachers of righteousness, demonstrating our faith to a lost and dying world through both our words and our deeds. Church, listen. When we turn from our sin and we turn toward our God through faith in Christ alone and what he accomplished for us on the cross, then we will be righteous, we will be blameless, and we will walk with our God doing all that he commanded us by the inner strength of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And then church, like Noah, we will find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come once again to feast at the table of your word. Lord, we thank you for your word is life. Your word is health to all our flesh. Your word is truth. So we receive the truth of your word and we ask that you equip us and prepare us in the days ahead to acknowledge all that Christ has done for us on the cross, to extend our faith in Christ and Christ alone, in his ability, in his grace bestowed upon us through faith to make us who we ought to be, that we can walk worthy of the call that you have called us by. Oh, Lord God, that we, like Noah, would be found righteous and blameless, walking with you when the trumpet sounds, Lord God. When you come to take your bride away, we pray that we would be counted worthy to escape these things that are coming to the earth. And we know that worth, Lord God, that righteousness, that blamelessness can only be found when we are hidden in Christ. So it is in him and through him we extend our faith and thank you, Father, for equipping us and making us the men and women that you predestined us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, beloved. I'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us this week as we study God's word together. For those of you watching on YouTube, please subscribe and don't forget to hit the like button. I want to encourage those of you who haven't done so already, please join us on our official online church platform. There you can watch our weekly messages when they go live, as well as connect with our church family. Also, don't forget to check out our website at faithcc.com where you can receive additional messages and see our upcoming services. At this time, I want to thank all of you who have been supporting our church and ministry with your financial giving. Guys, you are a blessing to us. Together, we are able to fulfill our mission, which is to transform individuals and families through the gospel into empowered followers of Christ. If you would like to give now, please follow the prompts on your screen. 
At this time, once again, I want to thank you all for being here. And I want us all to remember, church, as we go through this week, that together we are living truth, changing lives, and loving God. God bless you.